I'm so glad to be here and I appreciate this opportunity and the forum that you're providing. I think it's important to uh, get our views out to the voters. Thank you. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for this open seat in the 24th District? Sure. My name is Jason Holzman. Uh, for the past six years, I have uh, served in the Missouri House of Representatives. I represent South Kansas City and Grandview, elected for the first time in 2006. Uh, I'm married to uh, Robin Holzman. She is a fourth grade school teacher at Red Ridge Elementary in the Center School District, uh, where both my children, Savannah and Grant, eight and six, attend. Um, I chair the Committee on Renewable Energy, and I chair the Committee on Urban Agriculture. So food and energy security and the clean, sustainable future intertwined with the economy are very important to me, and it's issues that I've worked on in my time there. I was a high school teacher before I got elected in the Casey Mill School District, coached football and baseball, and uh, really enjoyed that opportunity to, to have a different side of public service, and uh, we'll bring that with me into the Senate when we try to discuss education reform. You have been tireless on environmental and education issues during your time in the General Assembly and managed to get things done in spite of an overwhelming right-wing, anti-everything majority. How did you manage that? Well, it's, uh, it's about building relationships. It's about communication, messaging, uh, being the uh, most well-read on the subject helps, trying to go to as many conferences as you can, uh, being prepared before floor debate, before committee work, understanding the uh, consequences of the bills and, and, uh, and the benefits and rewards to the state, and really just being determined and focused. And there was a couple times my first year when we worked on the Easy Connection Act where I had to break out the defibrillators and everybody told me that uh, the bill was dead and we shocked it back to life. And, and really I think that there was a combination of just uh, naivety in the beginning, not knowing that, that a freshman minority member wasn't supposed to pass legislation, to learning how to really be effective and, uh, and build the relationships necessary to move legislation forward. You mentioned that you were chairman of the Renewable Energy Committee in the last session. Was that because no Republican wanted it? Uh, I think it was a combination of, again, being the person who cared the most about the issue. I think that's probably the most important aspect. Uh, along with that commitment comes the education necessary to be effective in the issue. Uh, Speaker Tilly knew that he had an issue with uh, the renewable energy standard being gutted with SCR1. They knew that the PSC rules weren't going to apply properly with the geographic sourcing aspects of the bill. And he needed to work on this. And out of all of the legislators he had to choose from, he felt that I would make the uh, best person to chair the committee. And he asked me to do it. And after a couple of stipulations that I had in terms of uh, uh, what I was willing to do on the, on the bill and the committee, uh, we agreed and, and um, went forward and we had over 50 hearings and we passed six pieces of legislation out of the committee and, and over two years we really messaged well on why renewable energies must be a part of our portfolio going forward for our state. What's the status of renewable energy in Missouri right now? It's better than it was six years ago. Uh, whenever I was first elected, Missouri was a fairly dark place. Uh, on renewables. We didn't have a net metering law. Uh, we didn't have property says clean energy passed. We didn't have an RPS. We didn't have an RES, which are essentially function of the same thing. Uh, we have moved the ball slowly down the field. Now it's, it's not anywhere where it could be. And uh, there have been some national folks who have looked at Missouri and said, you have so much potential here for solar development, for wind development. And it's really gone unrealized. Even with the 2008 step that we took with 66% of the people voting for the referendum, uh, legislative meddling, legal cases, uh, the fact that utility companies haven't embraced the opportunity that's been put in for front of them to uh, make this a reality for our state, uh, we, we are still in better shape and we're actually in, in a good position moving forward with the right will and uh, political investment of our own um, initiative and capital into this area, we will start making large strides. Great. You sponsored and passed the property assessed clean energy legislation in 2010 mm -hmm. and the Easy Connection Act in 2007. What did those pieces of legislation mean for Missourians? Well, the Easy Connection Act was sort of the pebble that started rolling downhill on the entire issue. Um, it established a net metering relationship with the grid. Now, before the law had passed, it was very difficult for an individual or a business to install solar panels on their property. Uh, the utility companies had a very cumbersome 
process where you would submit an application, the application would be reviewed in maybe six months before you heard back. Uh, there were lots of uh, hoops to jump through that, that were intentionally placed there because uh, they didn't see the benefit in having their product. And I had one of uh, the utility folks over my career say, uh, well, you don't ask Anheuser-Busch to hand out beer making kits. And that's sort of what a solar uh, system is, is it produces your own power for you, which has always been the uh, uh, purview of, of the utility companies. And they didn't want to cut into that market share. But fortunately for us, Kansas City Power and Light has been a very progressive company, uh, and that's nationwide. They've been a leader on a lot of this uh, renewable uh, green efforts. Uh, they had an agreement with the Sierra Club to do so much wind in the last uh, few years. And, and, and so they, they partnered with me on the Easy Connection Act in 2007, and uh, we worked out the finer details of it, which would allow a net metering relationship with the grid. So when I install solar panels, it's one sheet uh, to fill out for the utility company. They had 30 days to return it to you. Once they returned it, as long as it was certified by an electrician, it was installed. You, the meter would literally spin backwards while you were producing your own energy. And then at the end of the year, if you had credits left over, um, those would zero out and not have any monetary value. That was part of the um, compromises we made. This year, we came back to revisit that and tried to get those credits, just like rollover minutes do in a cellular plan, to roll over to the next year. So that way, if you have a snowbird who goes out of town for five months and they're doing nothing but generating electricity on the grid, when the year's up, they can still use that in the following year. And that was something that we, uh, we pushed uh, unsuccessfully uh, this legislative session. So you'll be revisiting We'll be that. revisiting that. And also it established the size of the systems. 25 kW uh, was the largest that uh, can get incentivized through uh, Proposition C. Uh, the Easy Connection Act allowed for a maximum of 100 kW per meter to be installed. Uh, this year, again, we tried to expand that to 250 so that uh, larger facilities, like uh, Coffin Stadium being one that did actually uh, install solar, could use larger systems for more of their demand. Um, and then the, the PACE legislation that you also asked about, property assessed clean energy, would allow municipalities to create clean energy boards, which would put a bond out there to provide financing for individuals that then would be paid back through their property taxes over a 20 year note. And the uh, installed panels would then become a part of the property value of the home. It would be a capital investment. It could be uh, loaned against, borrowed against, and it would travel with the home. So if the homeowner sold the home, that value would then go to the next homeowner as a part of the overall property value. What sort of incentives are out there for Missourians who want to reduce their bills and make a dent in fossil fuel emissions in the process? Uh, the 2008 Proposition C uh, provides for a $2 watt solar rebate. Uh, when we started the Easy Connection Act in 2007, the cost of retail installed solar per watt was about $10 a watt. Uh, today, if you get uh, a good reputable installer, it's about $4.50. So it's come down quite a bit. The $2 watt rebate continues to help lower the cost because it increases demand uh, for the product, which then it helps make more manufacturing. And the more panels are put in the market, then the, the price will continue to fall. Um, that $2 watt rebate has created 36 solar companies in the state. It's produced 1,500 jobs for Missourians uh, for sales, installing, servicing of solar panels. And it's one of the uh, success stories that we can point to from the renewable energy standard that we can have data from that shows that this has worked in direct job creation. The Ninth, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals recently upheld an EPA rule on emissions that surely made heads explode in conservative circles. What does that mean for Missouri, and what does it do to set the tone for the next session? I seriously doubt that they mellow out between now and January. No, the EPA is one of those um, framing lightning rods that the Republicans use politically. Uh, it's, it's an easy target. It's something that a lot of folks don't understand uh, exactly what it is that the EPA does. Um, and just having the word agency in your title makes it, makes it something the Republicans go after. And they do, and they have non-binding resolutions saying that the EPA is you know, overstepped its bounds here or there, or, or is bad for business, or is bad for the state. And uh, we, we, I've seen it every year come up where this debate's hit the floor, and we've had to explain to them that before the EPA, let's go back to the uh, time when uh, polluters dumped their toxins right into the rivers, and these are the same rivers that we use recreationally. Uh, and because of the administration's efforts to clean up 
through the 70s and 80s and, and into the early 90s, uh, we have a thriving tourism here in the state of Missouri because of protection uh, that, that the EPA provides and, and DNR and a, a lot of the governmental agencies. And this gets into a larger frame of the role of government. Um, I have conservative friends who would like to abolish a lot of the federal government. And I say, okay, let's have that conversation and we'll pull out you know, the, the, the 16 cabinet government positions and say, start, you want to start with the FDA? You want to not have inspections for our food? You want to get rid of the Department of Agriculture? You want to, wh what is it in this list that they do that you don't like, that the outcomes? And then once you start really breaking down what the role of those uh, departments do, it makes it much more difficult to start saying, well, let's get rid of them. You were also the chairman of the Urban Agriculture Committee last session, the first one ever established by any state legislature anywhere in the country. Again, I have to ask, was that a gavel no Republican wanted? Uh, well, actually, this is a very nonpartisan issue. Everybody has to eat. Everybody is, uh, well, everybody should be concerned where their food comes from. Uh, we wrote, I wrote the language to create the Joint Committee, and um, I got it from, um, there's a program on NPR called Bioneers, and this was about five years ago, and they highlighted a woman named Debbie Wicks who uh, uh, started the White Dog restaurant in Philadelphia. And her idea was simple, and this was in the early 90s. She wanted to only sell food that was sourced within 100 miles of her restaurant. So she went out and made relationships with the farmers, local farmers, got direct lines from them for the food, and then her menu only consisted of food that was located within 100 miles. And I, I heard this program and I was intrigued by it, so I started looking into it further. I discovered uh, the notion of vertical farming, uh, taking abandoned buildings and, and turning them into uh, uh, produce centers. It was conceptual at this time. Again, this is about five years ago. I was a, a freshman in the legislature. And we started seeking out success stories. And so my wife and I traveled to Milwaukee. Uh, we toured uh, Sweetwater Aquaponics. We toured Will Allen's Growing Power. Uh, we saw for ourselves this sort of idea go into practice in a very real way that created jobs. Sweetwater uh, took a, um, an abandoned uh, factory that made rail cars and turned it into a uh, agriculture center that now produces 55,000 tilapia a year, uh, all the greens and different specialty items that go along with uh, growing indoors. Uh, and and what, while we were there, and this was in 2009, uh, we saw a van back up from one of the restaurants. They took a bucket, threw some ice in it, took a net, scooped out fish, tossed it in the bucket, put it in the van, and that was dinner for that restaurant for that night. And I thought to myself, this is the future, and this is the direction that we need to go in for our state and for our city. If I can take blighted buildings that we have in Kansas City and start putting economic activity in them, while we're producing our own food locally, giving us this, the, a secure localized network, um, then I want to put some effort into that. So we wrote the, the language that created the Joint Committee. Uh, Governor Nixon's staff also helped, came in and, and sort of helped finalize it. And he signed the bill. We got it through the legislature. Uh, it was a, uh, one of those moments where you realize that being gone from your family for five months a year, uh, the sacrifices that you make with public service, because there are some, makes it worthwhile. And, and we set out on that journey. Uh, the committee was made up of five senators, five reps. Uh, we had five hearings across the state. Uh, we started out in Kansas City. We had a hearing in Springfield, Columbia, St. Louis, and then Jefferson City. We had folks from all over the country come in and testify about where the movement is nationally. And we're about ready to release, and we're hoping to release it sometime in uh, mid mid-July, a 100-page document called the Missouri Urban Agriculture Report, which is what the committee was charged to do, which was have these hearings, get this testimony, and then assemble a best practices slash the legislation that came out of the hearings and the state of the movement as it stands right now in our country and in our state and where we believe it should go and what are the benefits of that. And uh, we can definitely get into why it's important that we have a localized food system and what are what is the real hazards of the way our food system is is now and what kind of uh, problems that causes 
For those who aren't familiar with the concept of urban agriculture, would you like to tell the viewers what it is and how it helps communities and property values and the overall health and well-being of the, of the constituents who sure. live in an area where it's practiced? Well, it's a return to the past, first off. I mean, the urban agriculture was just life uh, in the late 1800s. And somewhere along the way, we have lost our connection to where food comes from. If you ask the average uh, you know, fourth grader where the food came from, they're gonna say Price Chopper or the Hen House. You know, they don't equate the uh, agricultural side of that. Now, I wanna be very clear before I go any further. Urban agriculture is not in lieu of commodity farming. We always are going to have commodity farming. The, the 6.5 billion people in growing on planet Earth are going to require our farmers to continue to have higher yields after higher yields. Urban agriculture does not have the ability to replace that production. It is a supplement, it is a way to uh, create economic activity in our urban cores where we need it most, and it's a step in the right direction to make us healthier. Um, but it's not designed to compete directly with folks who feed the world with wheat and soybeans and, and, and the like. Uh, having said that, right now we spend $800 million a year as a country buying out of season produce from China, just one country. Uh, we like our tomatoes ripe and red and the way that they look in June, we want them in December looking like that. Well, we can't grow them in the Midwest in December to make them look like that. So. We spend this, this uh, 800 million years with one country buying produce, and that produce is grown in a way that is uncontrollable from our vantage. And again, we get down to the Department of Agriculture and the FDA and the food inspection and why we have these government agencies protecting us, you know, and go back to Upton Sinclair and the, and the meat packing factories and time at Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, we've come a long way since then. That $800 million could easily be redirected into the urban cores to produce our own food. We have the technology, we have the ability, we have the science, uh, it's, it's all ready to go, we just need to take that next step. And that's what the Urban Agriculture Act was designed to do. Now we got it almost to the finish line, it got all the way to the conference committee report, so it made it through the House, it made it through the Senate committee, it was ready to be through the Senate floor which would have which finalized its passage, and unfortunately um, the night before the last day of session, the bill sponsor had other commitments and left the building without allowing the conferees to be appointed. And so the, the bill died before we could uh, take it up for final passage. But it just showed that the willingness to support the bill was on its last step, uh, which was very exciting. Because the bill rarely passes its first year when it's originated in that session, and we almost, we almost got it done. And this bill is it's, it's fairly simple. Uh, we create urban agriculture zones that the municipalities have to approve. And uh, in order to get uh, deemed a zone, you have to have a business plan showing how many jobs you're going to create, what you intend to produce, uh, and then you can be one of three, uh, one of three aspects of it. You can be a, a grower, you can be a provider or a processor, or you can be a vendor. So you can grow the food, you can process the food, or you can vend the food. Uh, vending is, I think, the most interesting because 75% of all the food sold in a UAZ vendor zone has to be sourced from either the county you're located in or any adjoining county. Now what we envision is, is uh, farmers having contracts with these UAZ vendors on a menu order basis. So they'll actually say, we need X amount of turnips, we need X amount of radishes, whatever, whatever the produce may be. And that'll close a local food network to where the local farmers aren't then having the carbon footprint sent far away. The average family today uh, sits down at a meal from food that was grown 1,400 miles away. It was um, you know, sprayed with pesticides, it was uh, preservative ad added, uh, it was prepackaged, it was put on a refrigerated truck, it was shipped across the country, uh, or it was flown across the country, and you're talking about taxing the infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure system. You're talking about producing an enormous carbon footprint to get that food to us, and then the time lapse from the time the food is harvested to the time it gets to our tables after it's set on our grocery shelves for a while, you're depleting the nutrients in that food. So for all of those reasons, growing on site, selling on site, producing the jobs that are associated with that are going to be a better way forward 
for our state and our cities and our overall health uh, because of the, of the many collateral benefits associated with that. And, uh, and so, and, 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 the, and the, one of the neat things about this bill is vendors who uh, qualify in the UAZ, a percentage of the sales tax that is sold from that food will go into a fund that school districts located in the county that that UAZ is located in can then grant from to integrate agriculture into their curriculum and grow their own food on site. So a lot of school districts have land available. They don't have the resources or the know-how to generate and create their own agriculture production. Um, my kids are eight and six. My wife teaches fourth grade, as I mentioned. I taught high school for five years. We know what school lunches are all about. And you know, I pack my lunch. We pack our kids' lunches because the food that most elementary schools, especially with high and free and reduced lunch kids have, is not a high quality product. And if they learn how to grow their own food at the location of the school and they get it into their cafeterias, then that is going to be a, a much healthier uh, disposition for our children as they eat lunch. Kansas City has a problem with food deserts in some of the poorer areas, especially on the east side where there is also an abundance of vacant lots and dilapidated housing, land that could be converted to growing food. What can the legislature do to remedy the food desert problem? It seems to me that the solutions there will, will require creativity and that's a quality that legislative bodies are not known for possessing or embracing. Mm. Well, this uh, last session, one of our successes, the Kansas City delegation rallied around the uh, land banking bill. Uh, it was co-sponsored by the entire delegation. Uh, Representative Noel Torpy carried the, the legislation and the land banking bill allows for an agency to purchase properties that otherwise would be, remain vacant and repurpose them for entrepreneurial activity, in some cases aggregate them uh, to uh, make them more attractive. And that piece of legislation would have worked excellent in conjunction with the Urban Agriculture Act that we just spoke about, because then you would have the land bank purchase the vacant property, get it ready for, uh, for new economic development, then the Urban Agriculture Act would encourage someone to use that land to grow their own food, create a food hub uh, under the vendor part of the zone, and working in con conjunction with each other, we could bring rain to that food desert. We could have uh, localized production and sales in the areas that we need the most. It's, it's, a, it's a shame that many children grow up closer to uh, you know, uh, trans fat chips and, and uh, fast food restaurants and liquor stores that sell a um, lower nutrient level food, much of it's prepackaged. Uh, and one of the other steps is not, not only bringing the food to the deserts, but also teaching the inhabitants in the desert what to do with the food once they have it. Because it's not so much just having the food if you, if you take someone through a uh, farmer's market and they you know, pick up a couple uh, baskets of, of different uh, vegetables and, and fruit, knowing how to prepare the food, knowing how, what to do with it when, you, you know, when you're uh, cooking it is also an aspect or a step to try and alleviate some of this uh, hunger issues that we have and essentially, as you say, the impact of the desert itself. Because uh, it, a lot, let's be, let's be honest, a lot of impoverished families don't have transportation needs or don't or, uh, availability so for us who live on the you know the skirts where there's a hen house or a price chopper or a, um, you know a sun fresh located two blocks away we get in our car we drive to we don't even think about it we it doesn't even enter our mind as to the difficulties of families who don't have those options who don't live within walking distance where they get in their food and uh, and again this is all the underlying drivers for why this movement of locally grown, locally sourced food has been a focus of my attention in the legislature, a focus of the Joint Committee on Urban Agriculture's attention, why this uh, Urban Agriculture Act is so important to pass in this next legislative session, and we got so close to doing it this last session. Um, I'm very optimistic about the future of that industry. Food and nutrition brings me to kids, and you've been a great advocate for children and education and bucked the system to accomplish some of your goals, like bypassing the legislature and going directly to a publisher to get books. Mm -hmm. uh, thousands of books. 
That was innovative and creative. Tell us about that. S sometimes opportunities present themselves, and um, you know, I not 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 to walk down on a religious road, but I, I think that there are some elements of divine synchronicity involved with uh, service. And um, I, that was an opportunity where a, a friend of mine who I worked on a Senate campaign in New York uh, for State Senator Kevin Parker, he's a, he's a senator for Brooklyn, I uh, went down there and, and spent a week GOTVing for his race in 2008. He was in trouble and needed some help. Uh, and his chief of staff, and I got along very well. She ended up being uh, the public relations director for Rosen Publishing. Uh, I, on an off conversation, she said, hey, we're looking to do some charity work in the country. Do you have any suggestions on where we might be able to um, uh, really make an impact with the investment of our charity? And, and I said, you know, right here in my hometown would be a great place to start. We've got an unaccredited school district. We've got a mayor who cares about that problem, who has been engaged in it, who has a turn the page program that's designed to try to get reading levels up. And uh, it just was a fit. And so uh, she came to Kansas City along with uh, the CEO, Roger Rosen of Rosen Publishing. Uh, we met with the mayor. We met with uh, Link Deposit, who was going to be the distributor of the books. We met with the superintendent of all the school districts. And at the end uh, of our time, 10,000 books made their way into the hands of second and third graders of KCMO, uh, Center, Grandview, and Hickman School Districts. And it was one of those things where I was just glad to have been sort of a catalyst to make it happen. And then I watched it uh, unfold, and my daughter, being a third, going into third grade, brought home the two books, and she was so excited about it. And uh, I'm a, uh, you know, I collect books myself. And to know that there were kids who didn't have the economic means to start their own libraries, uh, for us to be involved with getting those books to them really um, was a, a nice thing to be a part of. And um, outside of all the politics and everything that happened in elections, uh, public service sometimes manifests itself in ways that you can't predict. And as long as you're uh, open to good things happening and you believe in positivity, then they usually do. And, and that's been my experience throughout my career. In 2009, uh, the Jackson County Advocate ran a story saying that there was a school supply shortage in South Kansas City, uh, basically putting out a call for help. And, um, and we, my wife and I, being educators, we thought we were in a position to maybe help. Uh, we raised $5,000 from corporate interests in the area, Burns and McDonald, Gales Harley-Davidson, uh, uh, KCPNL, folks who have a vested interest in the community. And we purchased 800 backpacks. We hand-stuffed them. Uh, and we delivered them to those three school districts. And uh, uh, at least for a short period of time, we stopped that shortage uh, in its tracks and were able to get those kids prepared for that school year. And again, that was just an opportunity of service that comes along with uh, being alert and, and staying engaged with the community. You have been a strong advocate for teachers, getting the Teacher Compensation Act passed through a GOP-controlled state legislature. How did you pull that off when so many of them consider teachers the enemy? Well, we, let, me, let me be absolutely clear. We got it passed through the Missouri House. Um, the Senate hung up the bill. This was at a time, this is in 2008, and this was at a time when we were debating over the loss limits for the casinos and where that money was going to go. And the Teacher Compensation Act diverted $100 million into a fund that would have been available for building by building merit plans. Uh, so our idea was is the reformists want to have some form of incentive and competition injected into teaching. And this has been a part of the merit system that they've been pushing since, since I've been in uh, the legislature. What we wanted to do was say, okay, well, if you do that in the wrong way, then you're going to foster the competition that breeds isolation and uh, protectionism and, uh, you know, it, it's a dog-eat-dog, -dog, zero-sum game between teachers. And that is the wrong approach. That is the wrong way uh, to try and compensate and reward uh, success and, and, uh, and good motivation. What we figured out was is if we had the teachers collaborate and cooperate and share lesson plans and all be in the same boat together and that boat rose or sunk based on the totality of the building's efforts, then we were going to get a much, more, uh, much happier and better and well-received response from the teachers. We were going to see uh, those impacts, those, those result-orientated goals be realized, and then 
right now, back then and even today, we're still 44th in the country in teacher salaries. So that means that 43 states pay their teachers better than we do, and only six pay their teachers worse than we do. Uh, that is not a great position to be in when you're trying to recruit talent to help uh, teach the, the, the students. So this bill would have addressed that directly, and, and uh, Dr. Bob Bartman, who's the center school district superintendent, uh, helped me sort of figure out what those outcomes should be. He was the commissioner of DESE for, for a decade, and uh, our collaboration produced this bill. It made it through the House, and then all of a sudden the economy hit its uh, bust with the housing market. Our budget was uh, decimated. The uh, federal stimulus packages were brought in to help us bridge the gap in uh, our, our basic operating expenses and any additional spending associated with anything that wasn't core related to the budget was all of a sudden evaporated. So we have not revisited this conversation in four years because we just haven't had the resources to do so. But the legislation is still sitting there. It is still, we're still 44th in the country in salaries. We still know that this is a better approach to reforming motivation for teachers than some of the other alternatives that have been put forward. And if I'm elected to this Senate seat, uh, it will be one of the uh, uh, items that I would like to bring to the table to discuss in terms of where we go from here. Before we go, we have to talk about the big news of the day, the upholding of the Affordable Care Act by the Supreme Court just this morning. That surely has a lot of your right-wing colleagues in a tizzy, especially since last session in advance of the ruling, they tried in the General Assembly to outlaw following federal law, yeah. uh, even if it was upheld. Uh, what do you think their reaction is going to be now? I'll talk to a few of them today. Uh, I wasn't necessarily spiking the football, right. but uh, I, I was getting reading their reaction to what they thought the impact was going to be politically, and, I, and it ranged just like I, I thought that it would. Uh, I was certainly excited. Uh, this is good news for the president. This is good news for our country. This is good news for uh, the people who, previous to the Affordable Care Act passing, suffered uh, because they were denied access. And health care is its own um, very complicated issue that would probably take a whole nother 45 minutes of us sitting down talking to get to yeah. some of the points. but. Just as a as sort of a broad perspective, uh, this will now allow us to establish the exchanges here in the state, which I think was a, a, a moderate step towards what we need to be, which is a public option. Um, I've advocated for a public option all along. I've sponsored legislation that would create the uh, Kids Care Co-op, which would be a public option for children up to the age of 18. It would not have any income restrictions on it. Um, I think that the middle class has never advocated for free anything. What they've wanted is consistent and affordable health care that is of the highest quality. And, and when you have this sort of class warfare, it works both ways, where the, the wealthy who pay what they feel like is an, an exorbitant amount of the percentage of taxes that go in and then are excluded from the services that a Medicare or Medicaid provide, um, there, there's an inherent resentment that, that forms. And I think that you'll see it in the public schools as well. They'll be paying high property taxes and then they send their kids to private school, which is their, their choice. That's their choice to do that. But then they really have a resentment towards those public schools and don't participate in the life of the school to make it better. And, and I think that, again, that, that gets into a, uh, you know, the education uh, reform effort, but on healthcare, if we were able to pool our resources, and I'll give you an example. The state legislators, state employees are in the Missouri Healthcare Consolidated Plan. Uh, there's 100,000 people in the program. Uh, it has premiums, it has deductibles, it has co-pays. Uh, it is not a free insurance program whatsoever. But what it does do is it distributes the risk over a larger pool of individuals uh, that lower that cost. It's a not-for-profit, so you're not you're not building in dividend returns and and, uh, and profit margins into the cost of that care. And we know that there's only two ways that insurance companies continue to grow their profits, and that's by either denying care, which they did under the pre-existing conditions law, um, or raising premiums, which they have for the last decade. So I, I don't, you know, I don't. One of the reasons why I've been able to be effective in a Republican-controlled House and Senate is because 
it's real easy to devolve into a blame game and to villainize and try to say, well, the insurance companies are the problem. Well, the insurance companies have a piece of what needs to change. But the insurance company inherently exists because somebody at some point in time said, let's pool together some resources so that way we can provide people the insurance that if they get sick, they won't, you know, um, they, they'll have to see a doctor. I find it interesting that in a country that uh, it's, a, it's a right, if you commit a crime, to have legal counsel provided to you. It's not a right if your child, you know, has a, you know, a severe case of the croup or fever spikes to 105 that you can't automatically go in and have a doctor uh, take a look at them. And I think that if you look at it in terms of um, what should the normative aspects of our human family, what should we be doing in this country, I think very clearly a uh, majority of the people would say take care of one another. And, and you don't do that by trying to deny people access to um, programs that, that make them healthy, that, that save their lives. And, and uh, there's plenty of examples across the nation where healthcare has bankrupt people, where it's devastated their entire livelihoods, and that then becomes an economic problem. And if we want to get out of this recession and we want to get into the future of this new sustainable way of living, then we're going to have to make some changes. And part of those changes need to be within the health care system. Now, I'll be the first one to admit that I don't think the Affordable Health Care Act is a perfect bill. It certainly has its problems trying to address a very complicated issue. Um, I think that it was done in a way that opened itself up to significant um, uh, I don't want to say ridicule, but uh, almost uh, detraction. It, it was a prolonged, uh, very public discussion. Uh, Obama seemed to want to have an organic bill instead of a bill that he just set forward and said, it's this bill or I'm going to veto it. And I think that that time that it took in the very public way it was done allowed for the town halls and allowed for Fox News and allowed for a lot of the detractors to ramp up their messaging, and then you had uh, that messaging was, was misinformed. You had uh, folks like Sarah Palin saying that we're going to have death panels, and, and, and when a large base of folks who really pay attention to politics, usually typically being senior citizens, uh, when they get scared into thinking that they're going to be kicked off Medicare, they're going to be denied their prescription drugs, or, or, or whatever really hits home to them, uh, then it's very easy to be against something that is a revolutionary change. And that's what we saw was this huge uprising of misinformation and aggressive detraction from a already very difficult thing to do. And we still have yet to get on the other side of seeing the data return on the benefits of getting rid of the pre-existing condition issue, of allowing the children to stay on their parents' health care until 26, of, of having some of the preventative maintenance that, that go along with, with, the, uh, with the bill. So all of that put together, today was a big victory. It, it was a reaffirmation that the President and the Congress set forth a piece of legislation with an intended uh, outcome of bettering the health care system for the United States and that it was done in a constitutional manner that has been upheld now and I think that it's time for the detractors to really help make this be successful. And that's what, you know, that's what more than anything else my wish for our nation is to stop the burn down the house at all costs mentality, get over the partisanship, stop the, the, the Republicans in Congress right now would rather see this country fail than give the president one single success. And, and what they don't understand is, is that in that failure, it's their failure too. And there's no reason why, there's, you know, there's, there's probably 20% on this side, 20% on this side that's existential. We're just not gonna agree on them. And those are things that, that are ingrained in the ideology that we share. But there's a great middle of things that are common sense that if we move forward on them, we can have a, a positive impact on our economic development, on our environment, on our healthcare system. And I just would hope that instead of trying to destroy a president, that they would allow a country to succeed. 
and that's and that's my my hope for for our federal government.